I took a first look at the Creality CR10S5 back in November of last year, but as I said then, I didn't have enough time to really put it through its paces, so today I'd like to tell you about my experiences using the S5 for a couple of months. Like the other members of the CR10 family, this is basically the same in its construction and general usage as the regular CR10, so if you haven't seen my regular CR10 review, or if you're not familiar with the CR10 in general, I would recommend that you go and look at that video first, and also the uh, S5 first look video as well. But just to give you a very quick intro, this is the largest and most expensive of the CR10 models. It has a 500 millimeter cubed build volume, so it's a gigantic build volume. And it has a heated bed like all the other models, but this bed is only partially heated. It's about 300 millimeters of the bed that's heated. This printer was sent to me for review by GearBest.com, and in fact, they also gave me a very good deal on a second one of these to help out with some of the projects that I have planned for the future. So I think I have a fair amount of experience using this machine at this point. One of the things I mentioned in my first look review was that it's very hard to find a place to actually put this printer because it's so large and you have the control box on the side. As you can see here, the way I solved that for both of these printers was to just have two utility tables kind of in an L shape and have the control box on the one to the left and then the printer on the right. Works relatively well, but it does use a fair amount of space. In my first look video, I printed a number of different models of different sizes. And if you're interested in this printer, I'd recommend you check that video out first, probably. But today I'm gonna be focusing primarily on large models because let's face it, that's why people are buying this printer. So the first model we're going to look at is a life-sized bust of the character Pow from Rogue One. Now you may be thinking, Pow, I don't even remember who that is, and it's not too surprising because he's not exactly the most major character in the film, but he is visually interesting, and it's a very nice model of him. It was created by Build It and They Will Come, which is a subscription service run by a British 3D modeler who makes uh, life-size 3D models for people to print on their own. You can check out the video description if you want to know more about that. I'm sure I'll be talking more about this service in the future because I have a number of models that I want to print or have been printing of theirs. They split up their models into many pieces for people with smaller 3D printers and into just a few pieces for people with larger 3D printers, but they also provide the full unbroken model. Depending on the model, it may or may not be a good idea to try and print the thing all at once. In this case, uh, just because of the shape of the head and all the features on it, it seemed like it would be a perfect candidate to try printing all in one go, so that's what I did. I should mention that this model will also fit on the CR-10S4, and it will almost fit on the regular CR-10, but not quite. I should talk about supports here for a minute. The support material generation in Simplify 3D, if you do it automatically, will want to put supports all throughout the head and side. And you really don't need that for this kind of model because it just sort of naturally forms a dome. And as long as you have enough top and bottom layers, your printer should be able to handle it. I went in and did manual supports like this just in the places where I thought it needed it. And uh, it made it take a lot less time, a lot less material. In many cases, if you use automatic support generation, it'll end up taking twice as long and use up maybe almost twice as much material. So it's something you want to avoid. You can see here the print is starting, and this ring around, the U-shaped ring around the, the head is where the support material was. Uh, this took about 90 hours to print at 0.24 millimeter layer height, so it's not the finest layer height, but it's reasonably good for something this size. I didn't have any problems with it, uh, just had to swap out the filament, I think, once, and that was it. So as I mentioned, not every model is going to be suitable for printing all at once like this. It really depends. You're going to have to make a decision on a case-by-case -case basis. In some cases, it may be a much better idea to do it in pieces, at least a few pieces, and you may actually save a lot on support materials. As I say, in this case, you really didn't need much of anything, but other models might require a significant amount of support material. But in any case, at least having the S5's gigantic build volume does give you the flexibility to choose to do it all in one piece when it's appropriate. And here we have the finished bust. And he came out basically perfectly. No real issues to speak of. 
And I'm really glad that I was able to print him all at once because I don't think I would have gone to the trouble to print him at all if I had to print him in a bunch of pieces and assemble him. It's not a character that I care that much about, but I really do like having him around on display. In fact, I, I think I will be painting this one sooner or later. I haven't gotten around to doing that yet. But even as it is, it looks pretty cool on my shelf. Some of you may know that I'm working on a life-sized R2-D2 project. It's going to be completely 3D printed and finished and painted to look like the real thing, as you can see here. I'm taking a little bit of a break from my project right now because it's too cold to paint and work in the garage, but I thought I might try printing just the dome, because as coincidence would have it, R2-D2's dome is almost exactly the right size to fit on the S5's build plate. Back when I made this R2's dome, I only had one printer that was a lot smaller than any of the printers I have now, so I had to print lots of different pieces in, in small chunks and then assemble them, as you can see here. And I thought it would be great if I could avoid that and just do it all in one go. Mr. Baddeley, the designer of the R2-D2 model I'm using, has a couple of different versions of the dome. One is made in these small pieces for smaller printers, and that's the one I used before. And he also has one for larger printers that has larger pieces, but he didn't have one that was just all in one piece, because most people don't have a printer that big, of course. But I reached out to him and asked if he wouldn't mind coming up with a model just for me to print on the S5, and he very kindly did so. I figured being able to print it all in one piece like this would save a lot of time and effort, but I wasn't entirely sure if the top in particular would print properly without any supports, and of course if you have to use supports then it kind of defeats the purpose. So I decided to just cut off the top part and try printing it and see if the bridging between the sections there would work, and it turned out it worked just fine. Even so, I wasn't entirely sure that this was going to work when I tried it, but I figured it was worth a shot. And as you can see here, it bridged across large sections like this with no problems whatsoever, so uh, there wasn't need, any need to use support material. This took about six days to print, so it's not exactly a fast process by any means, but it is a lot less work than having to print individual pieces and then glue them together and fill in the gaps and sand and so forth. So it's definitely a win in that sense. Now if you wanted to make this a finished dome like the one I have on my R2, it would still require, of course, some sanding and finishing of some sort, but it would be a lot less work, I think. I printed this at 0.24 millimeter layer height, so it's relatively smooth, but not super smooth. You would need to do some sanding. Here's the finished dome. You can see there's a little bit of faceting on the curved parts of the dome, and it just seems to be from the 3D model itself. Uh, I don't know if it's possible to smooth that out in the software. I imagine if you were to sand it, you could get rid of that, though. Uh, inside, you can see that there's some drooping just right here where it was bridging across the gaps, but that's on the inside and won't be visible at all. I don't plan to actually finish this or paint it, because I've already done that, but I am going to try printing out all the panels and things and in the appropriate colors and see how good of a look I can get just with 3D printing alone, just printing the parts out in the appropriate colors. So maybe I'll make a video about that in the coming days. The final model I'm going to be showing today is from the Skull Wars project. Now this was a Kickstarter made by 3D Kit Dash. They designed a variety of Star Wars themed skulls for people to print out on their own or to buy pre-made prints of. One of my favorites of these was the Pit Beast, which was their name for the Rancor monster. As you can see, this is a multi-part model. It's got four parts that originally went together with some pins that you printed separately. Although, for these larger versions, I'm just going to be gluing them together. So this is the model printed at normal size. This is the size that the backers of the project would have gotten. Now, of course, the nice thing about 3D printing is you can make things just about any size. So Originally, I tried blowing this up as far as I could on my printer, the Dremel 3D Idea Builder. And it's not gigantic, but it's considerably bigger, and you can see a lot of the details better with this. It still has the working jaw and everything. But, of course, it wasn't quite big enough for a Rancor, so I decided I had to go bigger. I had to try to print all of these parts as big as I could on the S5. And that meant upscaling each piece, I think around 650% so that it would fill the entire build plate of the S5. 
And unfortunately, that's when I ran into my first problems with the S5. As I was printing this piece here, I noticed I was getting a lot of layer shifts, where the model would apparently shift a little bit, leaving a, a noticeable line. Now if we look closely, we can see a number of these shifts right here and here, and basically, I don't know, eight or ten places up and down the model. I was willing to try and salvage this just by sanding it out or doing something like that, but it was kind of disturbing because I didn't know what was causing this problem and I had never had this problem before. Then it turned out at the top here that I made a mistake that made me cause this model to fail after a number of days of printing, which was not fun. What happened was I had originally had a shelf here on the left and I didn't realize that the gantry when it goes all the way up to the top on this printer was actually just hitting the bottom of that shelf so it couldn't go up all the way and it wasn't able to go up high enough to print the teeth. That was obviously my fault and I've removed the shelf and solved the problem that way but in terms of the layer shift problem it turned out that the cause was the very heavy glass bed combined with a heavy model causing a lot of inertia so that when you have the bed moving fairly quickly back and forth it can cause the entire thing to sort of skip a beat on the belt and just move everything maybe a, a millimeter or so. So it turned out the way to solve this was to reduce the speed of your travel movements. If we look at the speeds panel from Simplify 3D you can see the XY axis movement speed is 7200 millimeters per minute. I changed this setting to half that or 3600 millimeters per minute and I found that it solved the problem. I haven't had that problem once since then. This will, of course, extend your print time somewhat. I'm not exactly sure how much the difference is. This is not cu cutting your print speed in half or anything like that, because we're just talking about the travel movements. But still, it is going to make it take longer. When I was trying originally to figure out how to solve this problem, I decided I should make the model lighter, so I made the infill percentage lower so it wouldn't be as heavy. And generally speaking, that's a good idea. But unfortunately, this model has some places where it basically will start printing in midair unless you have a fair amount of infill in the inside. And you see here, this is one area where it just barely made it. Enough of it started printing on top of the infill that it worked. But on another section, it did not. And so I actually had to put a piece of tape inside there for it to print on top of. I wasn't sure that was even going to work. But as it turned out, it did more or less. Now there's still a little bit of a noticeable gap in the final model. But I don't think you'd be able to see it unless I told you about it. In my first video about this printer, I talked about how it took quite a long time to print even just a hollow model that fills up the entire build volume, and I speculated that it would take a long time to print something that had infill, and I was right, because this uh, full model that I'm going to show you all four pieces of ended up taking close to a month of print time to complete. Now, in some cases, I had them going simultaneously, as you can see here, one on top of the other, but still, that's a really long time. I also discovered, after I had printed a couple of these pieces, that this piece here, which is supposed to be one piece, wouldn't actually fit on the build plate, so I had to slice it, slice the model digitally, print them separately, and then glue them together like this. This here is the final piece and the largest piece, and unfortunately this is where I ran into my second problem with the S5. I came back after it had printed about an inch of this, and found that the printer was completely dead and wouldn't start up. After a little experimentation, I discovered that if I unplugged the heat bed cable from the main control box, it would actually start up just fine. But if I had it back in and I tried to have the bed move at all, if I just homed it, it would shut off. So one of the first things that I recommend when anyone gets a CR10 is to print the strain relief bracket for this cable here that goes to the heated bed. Unfortunately, the S5 has this sort of aluminum bars underneath that are acting as a reinforcement, and that means that you can't use the normal strain relief bracket that we use for all these CR10s. It does have, however, a sort of rudimentary strain relief right here, so I was just trusting that to be good enough, and obviously it's not. Someone on one of the Facebook groups did design a bracket that works pretty well. If I can find a link to that somewhere aside from Facebook, I'll put it in the video description. So I have installed that on my machine at this point, but one of them is basically broken. The heat bed no longer 
functions, and I have to, in fact, select a zero temperature for it to print at all. But luckily it will print if I do that. It just has a min temp error on the screen the entire time, but I can still print. And I actually printed this piece that I was talking about uh, with no heated bed at all. I just used glue and it worked just fine. And it made me kind of question whether I actually need the heated bed in the first place. So here we have all four pieces, well, five if you count this one that I cut in half, ready to be assembled. It's actually turned out to be kind of a happy accident because if I hadn't cut this in half, I wouldn't have been able to get these uh, things to go in the joints for the jaw. It just was way too tight. Even with the smaller versions I printed, uh, I think they were relying on you being able to bend the piece a little bit. But of course, when it's this gigantic, you can't bend it at all. And so I would have had to cut the piece anyway somewhere to get it to go in. And here we have the final model in all its glory. And I'll have to say this is probably outside of R2-D2, the most impressive thing I've ever printed. It is gigantic and quite heavy as well, because each piece, I think, used about two to two and a half, maybe even three rolls of filament. So we're talking 15 pounds or something like that for this thing. Uh, it still functions, as you can see, and it looks just awesome on display. Now, of course, it's not quite life-size for a Rancor. I think it's probably more like half life-size but it's still extremely impressive. So despite the trouble that I had and the amount of time and, and money, I suppose, in filament that it cost me to do this, I'm extremely happy with it. In fact, here is the original size model, just for your reference, a little bit bigger there. So what's my final conclusion about the S5? I do think it's a good machine and I'm planning to get a lot more use out of mine, but at the same time it's also given me the most problems of any of the CR10 models, and I think that's due just to its incredible size. Now some of these problems turned out to be relatively easy to solve, but the jury is still out about whether the strain relief bracket I printed will prevent the problem I experienced on one of my printers. Now I definitely would not recommend this as your first printer or as your only printer. A big bed like this is harder to level than small ones, which can be hard for someone new to 3D printing. And if this was your only printer, you'd end up having it tied up for days on end while it works on large prints. And if you're not going to print large things, then why would you get it in the first place, right? I would recommend this printer to someone who already has some experience with printing and who has other printers and who definitely has a need for printing very large models. Don't just get it because you think having a giant printer would be cool. I mean, it is cool, but the average person would be much better off with something like the CR-10S or maybe the CR-10S4 if you want something larger. That said, if you do decide you want to buy one of these, I do have a GearBest coupon code in the video description for the CR-10 S5, as well as all of the other CR-10 models. Thanks very much for watching.